All right. This is the fellowship of the link call for Wednesday, September 6, 2023. It is nice to see y'all. Um, there are sometimes a couple other people here. Aram, your keyboard is loud in our ears. Oops, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you are a ferocious typist. I uh, am impressed with your typing speeds, actually sustained typing speeds. It's like it's like a, an endurance race kind of thing. Um, and it's they, a lot of practice. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, I'm thinking we make a, a tiny intros. Uh, so David knows kind of who's in the room. Um, David knows me a little bit, but I used to be a tech industry trends analyst. I've just been digging through some of my old boxes and finding a bunch of like gems from from the distant past, um, including including applications for grad school and a lot of ding letters from people who didn't employ me and a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> I'm just dumping. Uh, but then there's a bunch of other stuff that I'm scanning, and then a few things where I'm keeping the, the paper. Uh, because it's sort of sentimental or maybe meaningful or something like that, but lots of stuff. And then, and then a whole ton of articles where, that I photocopied and stapled. And the first thing I do now is I Google for the title of the article. And if it's available on the web, I just curate it into my brain. Anyway, uh, I've also been feeding this mind map for 25 plus years, uh, which you are now in David and, uh, I'll pass to Chris if you'll introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chris Aldrich. I live rent free in Jerry's brain <laughs> <laughs> and have for a long time. Um, just loads of fun. Um, I've spent loads of time in the entertainment industry, variously in exhibition first, uh, agenting, managing, producing, even done a little bit of distribution. Um, uh, and right now we're all on a hiatus because the strike is giving oh, right. us nothing to do. So, right. How are you filling uh, your time? I, I spent some time working on a furniture refinishing project yesterday. So we'll have a new, uh, refurbished, uh, 1940 Shaw and Walker filing cabinet shortly. Cool. And I put it over here in the corner behind me. If the wife will let me, um, uh, I don't know what I'd pr reasonably well known as a, a member and tinkerer in the indie web space, uh, encouraging people to own and uh, operate their own websites rather than rely on social media to do that for them. Um, and uh, for fun, I'm an inveterate note taker. And Chris, so. Chris runs way deep on the history of commonplace books and sort of how did we share knowledge way back in the day, uh, which is really fun. Intellectual history, as they call it, Aye. in the in the deep academic circles. Aram, right, if you would. Yeah, uh, I'm just putting today's date in our notes. Um, it's just funny, Chris, because two things. One. We've talked a whole bunch, and I just realized in this conversation, I never had any idea what you do for your day job <laughs> until this moment. <laughs> I also have a, a biomedical engineering company that does micro manipulation, micro injection, and oh, microscopy cool. for like really high end genetics. Dang, I thought it was all Bako um, Sako. So I've got a I've got a hand handful of well actually more than a handful now because I think we're up to twelve uh, Nobel Prize winners. Um, on the client slate. Oh, that's um, really cool. I've done that for actually I did that because of the last strike. Um, the last strike got me back into the biomedical engineering <clears throat> side. So I maybe somebody has an interesting new job idea for this strike. Maybe yeah. that'll be my next company. So so every major entertainment strike spawns a new venture. There's a, hmm. there you'll see a big blip upward in startups, you know, during the strike. Yeah. Yeah. Seems good. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I am helping a few writers plot out and plan out spec scripts for when the strike is over, but yeah, you know, hit and miss. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I'm Aram. Uh, I, Aram Zucker Sharf. I 
currently day job at the Washington Post, where I lead privacy engineering. Um, I also have been heavily involved in publisher-oriented advertising technology. I write about it a lot. I work with other publishers a lot. Um, people it is a much longer story, but the interest in privacy actually comes from the ad tech side of things um, and figuring out how to do ad tech privately. Ah, hello. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm involved because I also am a very frequent note taker and a fan of uh, indie web stuff, though not as involved as Chris is. Um, I spend a lot of time making tools, mostly for myself, but occasionally they get to other people. Um, the biggest one that people in the indie web community are probably familiar with is uh, Press Forward, which I led development on for many years. Um, it's, an open, it's an open source tool for using WordPress to manage and archive a variety of websites. Um, the uh, That generally is sort of where a lot of my interests fall, archiving, linking, tool making, and um, sort of thinking about how to leverage these things in ways to improve stuff. Um, my current sort of uh, project within this context is uh, working on sort of how we link notes tools together. And the notes tool I'm using is an 11 t based system um, to begin with called context.center, which is the website name. Um, again, a tool only for myself, but um, it's open source and I'm building it out. And also just more notes synchronization tools is something that's very interesting to me. Awesome. Uh, Flancian, um, you can hear us? Is all good with your Jitsi? It's, uh, yeah, for sweet. a change. Magical. Uh -huh. um, I invited David, I uh, just met him recently, invited him into our conversation. Uh, he hasn't introduced him yet, but we're doing a quick round of intros, so if you would be so kind. Welcome, David. Do you want to go next, David? Oh, go ahead. Or do you? <sighs> Flansen, why don't you jump in and then David can go last. Okay. Cool. I go. So, uh, yeah. Well, so nice to see you all. I'm like, uh, yes. Welcome, David. So I'm a. Well, I, I go by the pseudonym of Flansen, but my name is Eduardo. Eduardo, I'm from Argentina originally, and I've been a part of this call for like a year and a half. Or Forever. A year, Feels like yes. a decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, I enjoy them a lot. Uh, so I'm a, a site reliability engineer by profession, uh, uh, but like yo, I, I got, like yes, I like a knowledge graphs, knowledge commons thinker uh, by uh, I guess preference and like a, a night and weekends dedication. <laughs> yes, and um, yeah, I'm also very interesting. Like well, pretty much what I what Adam just described on like you know making tools, uh, you know, I, in particular within targeting the knowledge commons, whatever knowledge commons uh, we can uh, put together. And uh, in particular, I'm developing, I've been developing this uh, sort of like platform protocol, it's sometimes weird what it is, it's unclear, called the Agora. Uh, and um, yes, that's the main project uh, related to uh, to the commons, I guess, uh, right now with uh, some other people, which is also about like, essentially like a proof of concept right now for connecting nodes, uh, knowledge-based wikis uh, that come from wildly different sources and just like whoosh, trying to like make a, like a greater whole uh, out of the parts. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, pretty much it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, Michael, how are you doing? Um, I, I met David recently. He's a brain fan like me and does other stuff. And we're doing a quick round of intro so that he knows who's in the room, if you wouldn't mind doing one of those. Sure. Uh, I'm Michael. Um, I am uh, in what is now called New York on uh, Wappinger Lands, the Ohlone. I'm not the Ohlone. Ohlone, they'd be on the other coast, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lenape. I spent too much time in the Bay Area. I, <laughs> flip of the tongue. Um, uh, the Lenape uh, greater lands. Um, and I... Uh, I'm very interested in um, uh, 
information meritocracy um, and how we all define it and uh, how we help each other find stuff. I um, have been working on a platform called Factor, F-A-C-T-R, which you will find at factor.com um, for a lot of years, um, have been hanging out in the Open Global Mind group for a lot of years, um, working with the Collaborative Technology Alliance, and um, at, which is a collaborative.tech, another cool thing. Um, I'm uh, involved with All Tech is Human, who are having a, I don't know where you're located, David, but there's a thing going on in New York this coming week, um, All Tech is Human is um, putting up about the future of social networks. Um, and uh, yeah, I my, my one liner about myself is I'm a designer, editor, archivist, activist. So. And you have pretty massive collections sort of on the on the archivist side of magazines and such. I, yeah. don't, I don't know what your range is. What's your like, what's the focal point of your collection? In my in my former life, I was a, a magazine um, art director, editor, um, editor at large for Time Inc. And I have accumulated magazines that were contemporary to my work going back to like 1980. Um, and um, and then made it a point to collect, you know, kind of in, in the past tense, viewing the um, the twentieth century as the magazine century because they weren't much before that, and they don't look like they're going to be much after that. Um, I've been collecting magazines of the twentieth century. That's that's what it meant. Great, thank you. Didn't yeah. didn't know where the boundaries lay. Yeah. Um, and David, if you would jump in. Yeah, uh, so I live in Dallas. You'll recognize by my accent um, very quickly. <laughs> but, um, I'm a, uh, I often describe myself as an itinerant software salesman. I grew up as an itinerant cotton farmer uh, as a kid and migrated to the big city of Dallas, Houston and Dallas and became an itinerant software sales guy and then a technologist of uh, some minor capabilities, but mostly uh, focused on trying to uh, help people solve big enterprise class problems and challenges through various different pieces of, of software. Um, I, I do have one pitch uh, for the group since we have some publishers here. Uh, my son-in-law runs a company called book.io that he is they are taking nft technology blockchain technology and creating a publishing environment where uh, you can own the books uh, you can resell the books I, you can loan the books to your friends set a due date on them and get them back uh, one of the interesting things that they're doing is uh, creating um, unique covers for each of the books so that you get some level of uh, rarity. So, and, and what's, they started out on the Cardano chain uh, and they will publish 1,700 books and they'll be gone in 20 seconds. They will, they're, selling them at about 20 to 30 dollars they're all in cardano so whatever the exchange rate right but but it's really interesting and they they now are starting to do audio and and you know control audio on the blockchain and utilizing nft technology so for you guys that are in the publishing uh industries i think you'd find it interesting to take a look at it. Uh, David's that's, also that's my pitch. David's also a longtime brain user. Uh, do you want oh, to I've been using the brain not as long as Jerry has, but uh, and not nearly as well organized. Uh, but since uh, uh, I think early 2000 was in my kind of first foray, and still have it. I only have I only have one brain. It's not great, but Which, it's uh, you know there. I thought I was the only brain user who had only one brain until we talked. So. 
there we yeah. are because it's, it's unusual most brain users treat it like word you know like a word processor where they make lots of documents mm. um and we can talk no, about I... the future of the book we can talk about other stuff uh thank you for the intros curious about what's on people's minds Michael, you were about to jump in, but you're muted, right? You're looking, yeah, for, the tab. You're looking for the tab. Have you found the tab? That's another yeah. problem with Jitsi. Is looking, it? looking to get back from book.io to, uh, to the Jitsi tab. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I was curious to ask, um, David, um, I, I'm, I see um, some, some like major kind of public domain publications, which is sensible, you know, I mean, like to create something that is uh, made special by its edition and limited, you know, cover or design. Um, I, I was just curious if you know about how, how that's working and whether um, with a book like Alice in Wonderland that I saw, saw was there, Swiss Family Robinson, so is one illustrator designer taking that title and doing multiple variations yes they have one artist um they have one artist he's using generative ai to wow. to create massive numbers of covers uh the the team is a very small team it's mm -hmm. five people uh maybe six now um and and so their one artist uh creates the covers and they the group kind of picks them puts them together in a rarity chart uh and and that's uh you see a lot of trading for rarity count as well as just the cover that you like right and so it's it's for me it's been interesting to watch um kind of the the so so they live a lot on discord um mm -hmm. and uh, and to watch the behavior of the uh aficionados of various different blockchains because they now they've now they're now publishing on multiple different chains mm -hmm. and in fact they are in this um sometime in the last three or four months uh they got to the point where you can actually use a credit card um so that because he uh, they call it the mom test and and the guys uh, the you know the the guy's name is josh stone uh and the question is can his mom go on the web and buy can can his mom go on book.io and buy a book and my wife fits in that mom mom, mm -hmm. mom category as well so it's it's interesting where there and he's he seems to be getting a significant level of backing from a number of different publishers and one of their interests is this ability to uh if you wanted to, let's say there was some book that uh michael you and i were talking about and you didn't own but you really loved the book loved the title uh that i could at some point in time I could send you that book, have a unique custom cover created for you. And and if you're, you know, let's say the book, you could find the book for $35, but but I'd be willing to pay that publisher $100 for the book because it gets a custom cover uniquely for you. Mm -hmm. And I, I the thing, the, the interesting thing, given your library of magazines, mm -hmm. right? The interesting thing to me is how do we how do we hold that library and share that library of magazines twenty years from now when or or fifty years from now when the world has forgotten that the 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 post had the most incredible covers ever, um, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting, David. It is books.io uh, an NFT gallery and scarcity play? 
masquerading uh, the, by, as, a, as a book publisher because it's taking out of copyright books and just you know putting nice covers on them? Or is it also a publisher where if you came up with a new book, would they help you make a book out of it and then put a nice yes. cover on it and make it unique? Yes. Yes is the answer to the question. They, 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 they think of themselves as a publisher and they are attracting, they're beginning to attract some number of publishers to their community. But the, the, what, what I notice is the publishers uh, that they're attracting, their books often don't, well, here's who they're attracting. They're attracting the, the writer who has moved himself or herself into self-publishing. They're tired of the publisher, et cetera, et cetera. And the way, the way they've created the monetary monetization for the publisher is every time a book gets resold, that author gets a, some percentage, right? So it's a different business model, if you will, than the standard publishing business model. It's and, a smart contract. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all a smart contract. And so if I... If I if if I have a book and you want to buy it, when you buy it, everybody in the chain right. who's, who's owned the book has had get some compensation for it. Yeah. It seems like there's an interesting possibility here for because one of the things that could happen is you could just attract people whose books aren't making it any place else. And so they're, they're coming here. What you sort of want is some really sharp editors. Um, who are hosting books or who are curating books or who are curating authors. Um, so, you know, Andrew Wiley is a very famous literary agent, but what is the equivalent mm -hmm. of Andrew Wiley on books.io in an NFT world? And, and how does that role change so that people could then start following the curator of a community of writers because these are like, they're, they're going to be better works. Right, right. And maybe that's just a fantasy, totally but, but that, I think that that's, that that's a possibility in, in this space right now. Sorry, Michael. It, it is. It is. Yeah, I would. I would think. I was just saying, having a sub imprint. Um, you know that that Books.io is the is the press, um, and not necessarily always the publisher to have imprints that, that live in that world. Yeah, and and yeah. and I know zero about the publishing industry. If he <laughs> if he weren't my son-in-law, I'd know even less. <laughs> so, so that's kind of in what's what's interesting because I've spent a lot of time in technology startups and done a host of different startups. Um, in the year that they they just celebrated their first year of their first publication, uh, and it's it continues to grow at an incredibly, for me, a surprising pace, a surprising pace. When they put a book out for for uh, publication or for cementing, uh, that those books would go in, you know, 15, 20, 30 seconds is is just pretty astounding to me. And and it's as they can build the communities across the different blockchains and and the real challenge obviously becomes how do how do I take that. To an even larger audience, so we'll see, we'll see. Interesting to get you guys feedback and comments on it as you go look at it. Cool, Aram. Yeah, I was just gonna say the. I think to your point, there is in terms of like trying to find an opportunity for sort of rogue book publishing processes that act outside of the um the norm i think like the other opportunity that's interesting here is editors but not just getting it edited right getting editors a cut right because this is this is a big problem that i have personally which is i i write professionally and i always could use editors and i don't want to use them for free um so any anything that i publish that gets earnings right now right the, the way that the structure works is you, you pay the editor on the assumption that you write something that thing will get some level of earnings so here's up front their percentage on that anticipation but I, it would be nice to think about ways to attribute credit better to 
to the editors and give them more of a royalty model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, man. Yeah, I just, as the smart contract technology and blockchain technology continues to advance, move forward, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I, I think you, I think we can arrive at a place where any contributor to some, whether it's a book, a magazine, a piece of art, etc., can it can now be on a royalty basis, right? I mean, I spent a lot of time around the the oil industry and the royalty systems that do those. That's a horrific math problem as, as it gets passed down through generation after generation after generation. So be interesting to watch what happens, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Beyond that, I don't think I'll be around, so it doesn't make a lot of difference. Well, th this platform is an interesting model, but I'm, on first blush looking at it, and I, I've just spent some time looking at different translations of Anna Karenina in the last month. Uh, at first, I'm shocked. I There's no name of a, the translator of the book I'm going to buy, so I have no idea which edition or which translation of many I'm going to get. But it seems odd to me to pay what looks like almost $35 for a public domain copy of what I'm, or what I'm sure is a public domain copy of a translation of a book that I own four print copies of at present. And the only unique or interesting thing that I don't have in making that purchase is maybe the book cover art. But right. if that was generated by an AI, which presumably it, I'm sure it is, Yes. You know, that doesn't have a huge amount of value. It seems to me so, you should rush to market and buy it now so you can complete your collection. I mean, I think the scarcity model should absolutely close the deal here. Well, I I don't think there's ever going to be a scarcity market for uh, for Anna Karenina or Tolstoy you, you in wouldn't general. I think so. Um, I, as you say, if when when you look at it, when you look at it on its face, um, you kind of say, wow, 150,000 or so books published in the year. They're all public domain books and they're largely acquired by, um, Cardano chain aficionados, right? So how do you, how do you take that? How do you get that to become an industry monetized, etc.? but they seem to have a significant level of interest from a number of big publishing houses that have given them some level of funding. So it just it, it, as with most startups, <laughs> they defy uh, life. Bentley, you came in a, a little bit late. We're talking about um, David's son-in-law's uh, startup books.io. Yeah, book. Book.io, sorry. Yeah. Um, good good correction. And um, that took us into sort of a conversation about NFTs and uh, how these different things work. Um, cool. And we can steer in any direction we'd like. What other things are on people's minds? Flancian, how goes the Agora? Uh, and, and, <laughs> and I think... What, weren't you going to at some point come back to us and like, like explain the agora in more in more depth so that we yeah. would figure out how it all clicks in? I would love to do that, and uh, I mean, I could improvise something now, or just we can do it next week if you want. And that like could I could work. do like a, the slide deck and so on, maybe. Yeah, well, how about? Uh, we'll I'm up for a presentation, but let's not do it next week. Let's do it the week after next week because I can't make it. Two next weeks, week and I want to make it. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I would love that actually. I, I I never want to impose too much. I I, I sometimes impose a little. We want to uh, we want to understand the Gora better. So, uh, thank you, uh, uh, me too. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you know, like uh, developing the Agora is like a means to understand it. Uh, sometimes, 
Uh, but yeah, I would uh, love to set the date at uh, 20th of September. Let's do that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And like uh, on wearable, on like a uh, news there, um, we um, have um, like, of course, like uh, uh, some other experimental hours up now. And like, uh, I'm still like trying to drill down on the model for like sharing things like uh, the ingestion paths into the hours. So essentially, how how to run a set of hours in a way that is efficient, instead of having every hour uh, have to duplicate work, like ingesting um, posts from social media, for example. So now we finally have like a shared repository of uh, social media um, uh, posts. So you know, uh, if anybody wants to like run an hour uh, and write to it from social media, it will be uh, easier to set that up. Essentially, they, they, they can rely on common infrastructure to do that. And uh, beyond that. The next big thing is, uh, as planned now, and uh, maybe your reaction will uh, reaction lukewarm or like positive or negative. Here goes will actually influence the priority of this and how enthusiastic we are about it. But like the next big thing will be activity power integration, which will be. Oh, that's uh, interesting. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, so essentially, uh, and actually, it's, it's this uh, serendipity aspect to it, uh, I mean, this has been the, in the background for long, uh, but, you know, uh, Banspo, who um, it was here, uh, Timur, right, who was here, like, uh, mm -hmm. in a past call, yeah, developer of Betula, uh, he's work, we're working on activity pub, and like, we, we decided to, like, work on it together on our respective projects. And then, like, a few people reach out to me saying, like, hey, is there any note taking app which is failures, like, enabled or is in the, on the failures? And I'm trying to answer that question. I, I found some things, but nothing very, you know, like, spot on uh, so far. Uh, and to me, that seems like an interesting space to, uh, to tackle. So, yeah, the, the idea is to actually have um, activity about uh, our integration done in a way that is tool agnostic. Essentially, if you want to have your notes uh, in the in, in, in the Fediverse and use sort of, sort of a convention to interact with your notes and the federation, including Maston and so on, right? Um, you could use the Agora for that. You just sign up for an Agora and say, essentially, an Agora, each Agora comes with like a, a matching Fediverse presence instance. And then, you know, for example, like uh, Jerry, now uh, Adam, uh, who have like gardens in an agora, you could say, I want to post this, or every time I, I create a new node, maybe I want that to be posted to username at agora, um, uh, which could be seen as a post from Mastodon. So essentially, it's sort of like a feed provider uh, model. So, uh, so is yes. anybody more familiar with the Fediverse who can name a note taking tool that is favored? There? I don't think, I, I mean, it sounds like you're sort of building the note-taking tool. I, I don't think there is a, I'm pretty familiar with the Fediverse and like, I don't think that there's something that's specifically a note-taking tool. Like there's lots of micro blogging and right. a smaller number of macro blogging um, and there's photos and videos and all sorts of other tooling, but I don't think there's a note-taking tool that's specifically Fediverse, but yeah. The the interesting thing is right in terms of what you're building, um, I like Obsidian does have the capacity for like different types of hooks as plugins. So if you had a thing that was like, hey, send it your notes here and we'll process them, the thing that could probably do that is Obsidian uh, with very little work in the. Building right. the plugin phase, the, the plugin like Obsidian and Publish, different. you mean, or something different? More like, hmm. sorry, ask the question again. Like Obsidian Publish, you mean Obsidian Publish, or are you referring to something else? No, I mean Obsidian Publish is a thing that exists and could be part of right. that, but more along the lines of right, like there's a good example in the first term, in like we, I think we mentioned it briefly on one of these calls, Obsidian Git, right. Yeah. Yeah. The idea, like, you can save things and then press a button and say sync with GitHub, right? You yeah. could see the same exact thing working to say, hey, push to an activity pub um, server and have it propagate there, um, right? So yeah. I could imagine a flow for um, the Agora where it's like you have your Obsidian and you have a designated 
um, Agora and you hit publish and it pushes to the Agora and that Agora populates out to the rest of the Fediverse. Yeah, yeah. So so the idea will be to, exactly, this is precisely a model, uh, Logsic, I mean, Obsidian, uh, some people use Obsidian, uh, eat. some people use Logsic, I mean, of course, we have, like, different other gardens, uh, you know, like, from different formats. They all have this notion of, like, automatically pushing, usually. And, yeah, the idea will be to, like, to, to some extent, this, um, this is a dream, right? It's like to say, if you agree on a commons, then you can essentially uh, get services through that commons essentially, with very little additional set of costs. I mean, this is the, uh, to some extent, the promise of every platform, right? And why, you know, uh, but, you know, of course, the Agora wants to do this as a knowledge commons and an actual commons in the sense of, like, free and fair and alive and so on. Yeah. So um, this will be the dream. One of the interesting things that would be fun to see that I don't think exists in the activity pub space is a different sort of UI. So if I'm taking short, you know, let's say index card size notes or tweets or Mastodon type things, you, you can publish them and see the most current one. But more interesting would be to go to that and see the thread of other notes that either come before it or after it in a longer thread right. so that you can follow some bigger chain of thought or create bigger chains of thoughts and yep. use that as your UI for presentation rather than here's a, just a stream of random stuff that I've been thinking in reverse chronological order. But here's a thing I thought recently right. and how it fits in with 30 other things around it, which yep. no one is doing. Exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, this is where, um, so the Agora bot has been trying to like experiment with this in the cheapest way that we could get running, right? But it's like, what happens if you take the same streams and then you organize the data in a non-stream first way? So, you know, like precisely, you know, going for commonality and like connectedness beyond like just the timestamp, right? In which they were emitted. Uh, in particular, in the Fediverse where like uh, right now it's, it's, it's very timeline oriented, even more so than maybe like closed platform because of the lack of algorithm, no? Uh, it seems like uh, this could be useful, right? Like just, you know, like essentially like, a, and I hear your Chris, it will be like a favorite experience, which is more like hashtag first instead of like, you know, time affairs. And when I say hashtag, I also say weekly, link, right? Uh, which is an open question I have, yeah. yeah. Weekly links everywhere. Exactly, weekly links everywhere indeed. And uh, yes, I mean, this is, the, I mean, uh, the, the plans for this have been around for a while with the living implementation, but uh, uh, we said uh, that we will do this in second half of 2023. So I guess that's pretty much now. <laughs> yes, so. Um, and the open question is how to represent Wikilinks in an activity pub. Uh, well, one open question is how to represent Wikilinks, um, given that uh, activity pub seems to a special case hashtags uh, quite heavily. Uh, but um, I'm pretty sure we will hack something together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, like just adding a link, link in the, seems like the way to go, right? And you could yeah. just have some sort of decoration to indicate that it's a wiki link. Yeah. Um, I know, like, I see your output on other platforms. You often use the double uh, um, bracket. I think, like, yeah. if you if you use that but also have the thing inside of it be a link, people, well, yeah. your, your primary user base, people like us will understand instantly what that means. And then the hope yeah. is you can build training off of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I bootstrap something completely. Yeah, this is the dream. Yeah. Uh, there's also the Wikilinks Everywhere extension. We actually have three, none of which works very well. The intention is there, but sometimes, you know, we leave execution. But once you install those extensions, those Wikilinks become clickable on the browser. Um, and of course, the intention there is to be able to, right now, they are all hard coded to an Agora author, which is not great. But the intention is to be able to say, like, set, define your Agora, and then all the Wikilinks are on the web, which are already anchored, will be automatically anchored to your Agora. Um, so yeah, uh, this has been in the works for some time. Uh, actually, I remember like I, I discussed it with uh, Samuel uh, before I joined the first of these calls. Wow. So, you know, slowly, maybe not surely even. 
but like uh, Sopro is, is made. Yeah. Sweet. And we'll, yeah. we'll learn Thank more in, in two weeks. That sounds Yes, sounds I'm really, really good. looking forward. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions about that? Um, I wanted to raise a, uh, for a second time a question I brought in that we talked about a little bit before, which is um, one that came up in a post I read, which is, does ChatGPT and things like it obsolete note-taking? Like the, the post was like, ah, eh, Tiago Forte system doesn't matter anymore uh, because we now have a way to query uh, and get responses in a structured way. Why bother uh, curating human notes? And I'd love to know how anybody thinks about that. I think that's a very typical AI disruptor take that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like the systems of note taking that we've discussed in the past are not just systems for recording. They're systems, right? We call it tools for thinking. I think I have that in one of our notes, right? Mm -hmm. They're tools for yeah. thinking. The note taking process is a way to manage entering the data into our heads to even think about it. And in doing so, it expands what we think about, right? You can only query things that you fundamentally can ask the questions for. And part of the note-taking process is expanding the type of questions you can ask. Um, like, I, I don't, the point, there's a really good a video essay I watched, which was like, and it's not a new argument, but they articulate it very well, right? Like, we are already cyborgs. You have a phone. It's nearby you right now. Mm -hmm. It expands your capacity to search for things. It gives you a lot of information at your fingertips. Um, but like, that does not, that that is still an, like, we should understand these things as affordances, right? That is like what being a cyborg is it is enhancing your capacity to do things but it cannot replace your decision to do a thing it cannot give you that information without you asking for it not really and so like i i think that's a the essay that you were talking about i haven't read it but it sounds to me like it's a bad take because it it is the same thing that a lot of these ai disruptive peoples do which is they do not understand that the process of what it is doing has value, right? Like, just like the process of making art has value. No one's going to look at a piece of AI art in the Louvre and think of it as the same way as somebody who spent a lot of time, even in a graphic design tool. Human, it, human intervention is what gives these things the value to us as humans. Um, and you can certainly do a lot with like AI art to intervene in it. Um, and there's a whole range of values there, but automatically recording everything we see, listen to, talk about whatever, and then hoping AI will extract the right outcomes when we ask questions of it. Like that is, a useful potential tool but it's not it's not the thing that i use note taking for mm -hmm. <laughs> and i don't think it's the thing that most people use note taking for if that was the case then like just record everything you've ever like attended and um go back to it uh, but that's not going to work you know you, you can't search you're not going to learn something by searching the transcript of a college class course about it right yeah it's exactly how knowledge works <laughs> yeah i'll i'll find i'll put that link in one sec yeah thank you um chris you're muted chris yeah me too yeah i was gonna say chat gpt build me something like the ethereum network to distribute books wait wait where is it what, you know that's we're nowhere near that happening yet. Um, in fact, you know, Siri and Alexa are barely good at giving me the thing I want right now, even when I know how to ask for it. So the issue is, what is the, I may not know what the adjacent possible is to every idea I have, but some of it's the serendipity and discovery of finding it. 
And even if chat GPT could give me the entirety of the adjacency, it's, it can only give me the adjacency that everyone has heretofore thought of. But if I'm Einstein in 1905 or 1904 better, it's, it would not be able to give me that next thing. And that's really what, you know, it's useful and it's great and it may make some more interesting, super hard targeted search stuff, but it's not, you know, it doesn't have, it's, it's not giving me the things I really, really want. Um, I'm, I'm unclear that thing that LLMs can only regurgitate things that have no, been known or happened before. Cause I think they can interpolate or infer new stuff. Like what's it, what was interesting about AlphaGo or Alpha Zero in playing just the game of Go was that it was inventing moves that humans hadn't been invented yet because it was just given the rules of Go to go, you know, beat itself. And it didn't have any of the assumptions of historic Go players who have, there's, there's kind of a bunch, there's a, there's a feeling and a sense and a rhythm to it that humans have incorporated by learning Go that the machine was like, well, screw that. I don't care about that. I just want to like win Go games. And, and for, to me, that was creativity. Now that's within an extremely narrow space of black and white stones on a 19 by 19 grid with a couple rules for taking territory, which is not what the real world is with pros and everything else. But I, I have a feeling that um, uh, like, like these systems are capable of some considerable creativity. Yeah, and I, emergence is, is fun. And that's really what you want is the emergence. What, here's a small, tiny set of simple rules. Yeah, un and until you, Jurassic Park strikes. And when you explore all of it, what are the interesting things that come out of it that you don't expect? And because an AI can take that and go through all of the possibilities, usually in reasonable amounts of time, then you can find out interesting things. But then once you've seen that, if you can query the AI to say, what are some other interesting strategies that human Go players historically have never used that I can use, and then you can learn what those strategies may be so that you could confound a, a master Go player, um, that would be great. But my guess is the amount of emergence you're going to see in those sets is smaller than you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael's got his hand up. Yeah, um, I was just going to mention um, that uh, there, there's uh, I linked to uh, a podcast with with the caveat that you know it's a 16 z and Mark Andreessen and at your own risk and all that. I mean, Mark Andreessen isn't on the podcast, but um, but uh, Mem, one of the pieces of software that's discussed is um, an inducing Horowitz investment. Um, but the conversation there about note taking and second brains and uh, particularly, you know, just that what you your experience of note taking is key to the notes being valuable. So so really, you know, having there there are virtues to having a, a a virtual note taker who's like processing a bunch of stuff and giving you a summary i mean that is, is useful in its way but being able to take your notes that you've created ideally you know over years and put them into a model that you can then query or or search um you know, and see the sources for that, that does seem like it, it's, it's sort of a middle answer, Jerry, to your question. Um, is ChatGPT going to make notating obsolete? No, but it's going to make a certain kind of note taking much more useful than it would have been in the old days where, you know, that, I mean, they're talking about what they've got in Evernote and, and realizing, you know, how much of it has never been touched since it was put in there. Likewise, I'm sure in your brain, there are, you know, many things you go back to, but there are plenty of things that were placed and you never return. Um, and then, you know, what, what, 
what's big and does get mentioned there is the idea that you know we've talked about before that surfacing the note that somebody you trust has shared with you somebody you trust on a certain subject has shared with you as you're trying to put together you know some thoughts about that subject that's what is really golden and what you know yes. um i think we're all <laughs> in our way working on um working toward yeah i have a I have a, an earlier tiny thesis that was um, that we, when Google came out and the archive came out, we, we kind of outsourced our memories to Google. And that was a mistake. We were like, oh, I, oh, I don't have to worry about cataloging or, or connecting up and collecting up and curating the things I see. I'm just going to Google for it later and that'll be okay. And it turns out that that doesn't it, it doesn't work really well because things that don't have a lot of inbound links don't get Google juice, don't, don't show up in the, the, the search results, a bunch of other bad stuff happens. Um, and the archive isn't as woven or searchable as we wish it were. It, it contains a, a lot of the, the, the articles once, once links are broken, but you've got to find your way back to them somehow. So anyway, so I, I asked the question of this group, partly I'm a big proponent of humans in the loop and human curation plus this new intelligence. I'm really interested in how it expands our capacities and how it gives us superpowers. Um, and I'm, anybody who's exploring that space is really interesting to me. It's like, like the, you know, the, the combination yeah, of the yeah. two. So yeah. I see, I see, and, and I, you, there are any number of, uh, recording and transcription services now that you can add into your meetings, right? And depending on what the transcription analysis is doing, right? For, for uh, most of them I've worked with and utilized have been focused on trying to help either help sales teams improve their communication skills and persuasion skills and or help sales management try to figure out what the real truth is about whether some uh, transactions are going to happen or not. Or thirdly, to do a reasonably good job of writing a follow-up uh, faster and quicker. But, but as you get a large body of this and you get it pulled together, the Jerry, kind of back to your point, utilizing something, using, utilizing chat GPT, helps me kind of get a sense of a large body of material, but it doesn't help me learn that material. Mm -hmm. I only learn that material when I begin to uh, ingest it, to take notes about it, to think about it, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you also run the same risk that over time, the things that you, didn't touch a lot, get lost in the mass of material, even though they may have been very beneficial to your to to the specific view that you were right. It's 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 your story threader, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. I have I have I, I come to the problem with a with a perspective that is different than the perspective that you have. Um, part of our, the conversation with, that I had with David recently started around my notion of story threaders, which I put out, which I think we've talked about a little before here. Aram had his hand up and so does Flancian, and I will have to leave this call sharp at the top of the hour for a different call, which means I will have to shut off the recording, but the recording will, will poop out like two minutes after that anyway. But, so I'm just yeah. warning everybody that I will have to drop off at the top. So go ahead, Aram. Right. Uh, I, I think the really short and easy answer to this is, you know, you can search what is basically the closest equivalent we have to all the knowledge in the world with Wikipedia in an organized format, Google to some extent, but Wikipedia really, but people do not stop going to college and replace it with searching Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's sort of the, the most clear comparison. I also have a hard stop at the top of the hour, mm -hmm. just a heads up when I leave. Thanks. Duncan? Together, I was driving down that type of observation. So uh, I guess just quickly, let's see if this is still relevant. 
So, I mean, playing a bit David's advocate, just because I love it, but you know, on the question like, uh, will uh, you know, generative AI or any kind of like uh, models also lead note taking? I think uh, echoing some of what you said is like, well, some kinds of note taking maybe you could make the point. Uh, and I think to some extent it depends on which uh, questions can be meaningfully answered by a model that 